The way we learn is no longer unilateral. So why do we act as if one teacher standing in front of a group of students lecturing them on a subject is the best way for them to learn a second language? Instead of teaching simple words or phrases such as bike or car, what if the focus was on developing the skills that actually help people advance their careers? The old way of teaching where you teach the same thing to everybody, teacher in front of the room using a textbook that gets purchased, no one thinks that's a good way of doing it. Good teachers would actually go out and try to find supplemental materials that were interesting to their students. They would look for news articles or short stories or something, but they can't take all that content and curate it and deliver it to learners. It's impossible for humans to do that. However, machines are really good at doing that. When I realized that that was the very best way to teach learners, I decided to try to use computers for what technology can do best to let people do what teachers do best. That's Dr. Katie Nielsen. She earned her PhD in the School of Languages from the University of Maryland in 2013, where her research focused on technology-mediated language training. Katie has dedicated her career to making language learning more accessible. And now as the CEO and founder of Voxy Engine, she's using technology to deliver high-quality, needs-based instruction to immigrants and refugees. On this episode of IT Visionaries, Katie dives into the way we teach language in the States and how it's a broken process and how we can go about fixing it. She also explains how her platform is delivering personalized learning at scale to those who need it most. Enjoy this conversation between Katie and Albert. IT Visionaries is created by the team at mission.org and brought to you by Salesforce Platform the number one cloud platform for digital transformation of every experience. Innovate fast, empower every employee, and scale with confidence from anywhere with a customer at the center of everything you do. Learn more at salesforce.com slash platform. Welcome everyone to another episode of IT Visionaries. And today we have the Chief Education Officer from Engine, Dr. Katie Nielsen. Katie, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. All right, right out the gate. What is Engine and what does it do? So Engine is a web and mobile platform that I use to teach English to learners all over the United States. And what makes it different is that we use real world materials to give language learners the English skills they need to improve their careers, to get into new career transition programs, to um, continue their academic studies. It's personalized, it's adaptive, it's based on uh, decades of research on how to use technology for language learning and how we can use mobile technology to deliver effective outcomes at scale. So one of the unique things about this is this tool is not used to teach, you know, like if there's a Duolingo, it's like many people to learn many different languages. This is for everyone to learn English, is that accurate? That's accurate. I mean, the United States has many, many, many non-native English speakers here who don't have access to instruction. Yeah, my mom is one of them, (laughs) (laughs) unfortunately. It's really hard as an adult learner in the US to get English instruction. So we meet the needs of only 4% of the adults who want to learn English. And the reason why I invented this platform and I'm making it available throughout the country right now is we need a new model to do this. So Instead of going to like a church basement or a high school at night to take free ESL classes where everyone learns the words for like what you say at the zoo or the ball is on the table, like a bunch of stuff that isn't helpful. This is a platform that learners can access on their phones anytime, anywhere to get them the English they need to do their jobs better, get a new job, understand what their boss is saying, understand the stuff that comes home in their kids' backpacks. And they can do it without having to go into a physical classroom. So we can really try to reach all of those learners who otherwise wouldn't have access to instruction. Yeah. And I want to dive into this a little bit more because this is where fundamentally your product and your, the things that you've invented are different, which is you're, you're not, you know, and I'd love for you to explain more, but like, you know, from my interpretation, you're not here to teach the, not the colloquial English that is commonly taught, like you mentioned before, these other programs isn't important, but it's. It sounds like it's like a, to take people to a higher skill, like more like business English. Is that accurate? Like you're trying to get people into a higher skill? Yeah. And I'd love to know a little bit about, you know, the technology that gets a person there. Like what is different and what have you uncovered or what have you found 
in your research that lets you say like, hey, this methodology actually gets someone to business English faster? So fundamentally learning a language, and it's great that you pointed out skill, learning a language is learning a new skill. So we need to approach it in a different way. It's not the same as teaching someone about how something works. Like to give another example, the U.S. is pretty wretched at teaching languages. It's why most Americans will tell you they took five years of Spanish and they can't say anything. <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> while most Europeans can speak, you know, two, three, four languages somehow. Exactly. <laughs> so like we teach people how to conjugate boot verbs and we teach them to like label diagrams of pinatas, but we don't teach them the language they need to actually do anything. So that's the number one mistake that my platform corrects. The other thing is that when you're teaching someone a skill, they need to actually use it and they need to pay attention. So the very worst way to teach someone a language or anything that's skill-based is to lecture at them. Like imagine if I needed to teach 30 people how to ride a bike and I put them all in a classroom and I let them draw pictures of bikes and we labeled the bikes <laughs> and we, we talked about bike riding. We talked about balance and we talked about which pedal should be on top when you start. And some days I even let them ride an exercise bike. And then after like a year of all of this, we went outside and I gave everyone a bike. They would all fall down right. because they would have no idea how to ride a bike. We wasted all that time. So when you're teaching someone a language, you want them to practice listening to it and reading it and watching people use it and speaking it right away. And they have to pay it. It has to be interesting to them or they just won't pay attention. Like adults are horrible at paying attention to things that are boring. That's why if you're listening to someone tell you a story that's not interesting, you stop paying attention. You think about something else. And that's what we make language learners do. Like the teacher will just decide, like today we're going to read this article about whatever and make everyone in the whole class read the same article. If it's not interesting to them and they don't care about the topic, they're not going to pay attention to it. So my platform takes large amounts of real world materials, everything from what's happening in the world today, breaking news stories to employee benefits manuals, if I'm working with specific employers, to technical information about like the language you need to become a certified nursing assistant or a pilot. And it figures out what level the language is most appropriate for. So I can give it to learners at the right level. I figure out which keywords they need to know. And I do all that automatically. That's what I have the 10 patents on is the ability to level text, find the most important keywords, and then turn them into lessons. So I have tens of thousands of different lessons in the platform. So learners get exactly what's relevant and interesting to them at the right time on their mobile devices. All right. So this is where the, of course, this is IT Visionary. So this is a tech-driven podcast. We're now crossing over to this subject. You know, in the past, foreign language curriculum, I'll say, is was probably done, what, by a couple of instructional designers. They, they put together English curriculum based upon whatever it is that they thought that they could put in a book. Exactly. That's what, it, that's what it feels like it sounds like, right? What you could put in a book and also what you could dictate or control in an environment of, let's say, 20 people where, you know, if you think about how education was designed, education was designed with the idea that each of the students had no other access to any information other than what the teacher was saying. So therefore, it had to be unilateral. And so this is where data and modern app technology unlocks a new way of education. You mentioned earlier that you were able to develop patents and you know, I want you to dive into them. What exactly were you able to uncover, learn, or figure out that was unique? And then I'm also curious, this is a secondary question I'll add on after you explain what, you, what the patents are about. And you know, were you always intending to use this inside of a technology of your own? Or like, what was the genesis of this? Or was it more like the technology caught up to what you were developing. And now it was like, okay, I have a way to deliver my, my hypothesis to, uh, to people. And this methodology is going to get better results. I'd love to dive into that piece of uh, how you came up with this product. So the first part of your question, you're exactly right. The old way of teaching where you teach the same thing to everybody, one size fits all, teacher in front of the room using a textbook that gets purchased. No one thinks that's a good way of doing it. And good teachers would actually go out and try to find supplemental materials that were interesting to their students. They would look for news articles or short stories or something, but they can't take all that content and curate it and deliver it to learners and really individualize instruction. It's impossible for humans to do that. However, machines are really good at doing that. Yeah. So when I realized that that was the very best way to teach learners, I decided to try to use computers for what technology can do best to let people do what teachers do best. 
So I don't want to get rid of teachers, but I want to take away that piece, the personalizing instruction and giving them access to content that's interesting to them. So what I invented was a way to use the very best of what computers can do. They can automatically level a text. So instead of having a teacher read through tons of articles to figure out what's good for a level one student, what's good for a level two student, I can do that in a second. I have a model that predicts the difficulty of a text based on what makes reading in English difficult for non-native speakers. Mm. Then I can pull out all the most important keywords. Again, this used to be something that a teacher would do by hand, sit there and highlight like five words that were really important. The computer can do all that. So I have a, a text, a keyword extractor that I built that can pull out the keywords that are most important, automatically define them. The coolest piece of the technology that I built though, I think is the distractor generator. So when you're creating multiple choice questions, thinking of the right answer is not actually the most important part. The most important part is thinking of what the wrong answers are, Hmm. because that's where you're teaching learners, because they're choosing between three wrong answers and the right answer. So if let's say you're filling in the blank with some sentences from an article. If you just pick random words as the wrong answers, it's pretty easy for the learners to see what the right answer is because the other ones really don't make sense. You want to pick words that are close to the right answer, but slightly different in different ways. This is like SAT trickery. Exactly. Like they specifically put answers to questions like uh, if you don't know your order of operations in math, for example, like if you didn't know your order of operations, you went left to right, they would have an answer that fits exactly that. Exactly. That is exactly what I'm talking about. But if you're thinking about it for language learning, it might be a word that is similar in spelling, but not exactly the same. Or Mm. like you could use words that are similar in spelling because you're listening to them and you want to choose words that sound pretty close together. So my tool can generate a bank of potential wrong answers for every single keyword in the text automatically. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and then the software can choose which wrong answers to use and which activities to pull based on how the learner is performing in the platform. So we can really personalize instruction at scale. Like this is what good teachers do. If, if you have a one-on-one situation and you have a, a tutor teaching you a new language, they can personalize what they're giving you and find you resources that you like and ask questions based on how you're performing. But we can also use the computer to do that, which is what I, why I built the platform to do this. Now, that is pretty fascinating. Now, I'm curious, when you first got started, was it only one language to English? Or, and the reason why I ask this is because I'll give, I'll give an example. So I am of, I'm born in States, but I'm the son of immigrants. Their primary language was Mandarin. Uh, my dad grew up in China. My mom grew up and born and raised in Taiwan. And one of the things I didn't realize until I got older was like, why don't people who speak Mandarin use plurals very well. You know, like it's commonly made fun of in the language where it's like, you know, 50 cent, right? Like they don't use plurals. Well, and then I, you know, at the time you're a little kid, you don't really think about it. But as I got older, I was like, well, there's no plurals in Mandarin. Exactly. Like literally the direct literal translation is, would be like, you know, I caught six piece fish. Like they wouldn't say six fishes. You know, they, there's no plural. There's no plural in Mandarin. Exactly. So the whole idea of using plurals to someone who's speaking Mandarin for 30 plus years, it's very foreign, <laughs> right? Yes. But that's just Mandarin. You know, you, uh, I didn't know, like when you were developing this tool, was it primarily, because I would assume a, rom- a romance language is going to be easier to learn English, but then well, who has the hardest time learning English? It's got to be people who are like from completely different languages. I'm curious how you approach this problem. So you're right. Your first language does influence how you understand and learn your second language. It doesn't to the extent that you might think. So when you're teaching English in the US or the UK or Australia in an English rich environment, you teach in English. So you wouldn't change your instruction based on the language that your students speak. You would just teach them English. Now, every student is going to struggle in different ways, sometimes influenced by their first language. Like you just said, the the way that you make things plural in Mandarin is different from English. You put a marker in front of the word rather than adding something to the end of the word. Right. So that's something that The software that I built right now doesn't actually account for first language, and it would be a way to improve it, would would be to improve the model to do that. That's something that I would actually love to be able to do. But it doesn't make as big a difference as you think. I've used it to teach English to learners all over the world from dozens and dozens of different first languages. And the real indicator of whether or not software is going to work for language teaching has to do with how motivated the learners are 
what their levels of digital literacy are, like how comfortable are they with using a computer or a phone to learn versus learning in person. And it has less to do with what their first language is. So you're saying that wherever I speak originally, the process isn't that much, or I guess the process is different, but the, the computer application will help basically build a path for me. Exactly. It'll build a path for you because you'll get practice with where you need the most help. Like it sees what you're getting right and wrong and it adapts the instruction based on your performance. I also have APIs with Google Translate and I have instructions that are translated into 14 different first languages. So learners can read what to do in their first language and they can get automatic translations of keywords using the Google API whenever they need to. Oh, that's pretty cool. Now, you know, I'm, I'm curious for yourself, what was the motivator, I guess, to do this? I, we, you know, we looked you up on LinkedIn, as we do with all of our guests. We see you uh, went to UVA. I went there as well. Did you? We didn't, we didn't cross paths. Yeah, I, I was there from 99 to 02. Oh, that's so funny. Wahoo, wah. <laughs> exactly. You know, in your degrees are all in language. You know, we can see second language acquisition. You got your doctor of philosophy at University of Maryland, you went to, you got your MA in linguistics at the University of London. You went to, it's, it looks like you studied Spanish at UVA. So you've always been involved significantly in language. That's very clear. Did you always know that this was the problem you were going to try to solve yes. or did it kind of evolve differently? No, I always knew. And it's so funny. It started at UVA. So when I was a senior or a fourth year at UVA. A fourth year. Yeah. We're so presumptuous. Yes. <laughs> we are. I volunteered through Madison House teaching English to Mexican migrant workers. And I got out to this farm in Covesville. I think it was Covesville, Virginia. It was like a 45 minute drive from Charlottesville. And I realized I had no idea what I was doing. Like I spoke English, yes. And I spoke Spanish because I was a Spanish major. And I was the person who was supposed to help these poor guys who worked all day in the field learn English at night. And that was the solution to teaching them English. It seemed preposterous to me yeah. that that's how we were doing this. And I didn't know what I was doing. So that's when I first realized that this was a problem that I wanted to solve. And I, I went after I graduated, I went and backpacked around South America and I taught English in Chile. And again, continued to realize I didn't know what I was doing. So I got, <laughs> all, I got all those degrees because I was like, there has to be a better way of doing this. And as I got them, I realized there was a ton of research on the cognitive processes that underlie language learning. Like in labs, we know a lot about how people learn languages. But that never makes it into the classroom. Earlier in this interview, I told you we're awful at language teaching in the U.S., and it's true. But we do, we should know better. And there's a massive disconnect between research and practice. And so I, I worked in academia. I worked as a research scientist. I did a lot of research on using technology for language learning. Because the other thing that became clear to me as I was doing this work and getting these degrees and trying to get better at teaching languages was that there is a role for technology. We don't want to replace humans. Like we always will need people, right. but we can make their jobs much easier if we use technology to solve some of their problems. So I got involved in education technology and thinking through ways to really improve instruction using technology. And it all sort of came full circle. And so NGEN, which I founded a couple of years ago, is completely dedicated to helping immigrants, refugees, and speakers of other languages in the United States get the English they need to improve their own economic outcomes. And like I said earlier, help their kids with their homework, do whatever it is they want to be able to do in English because they, what they get stuck with is like a well-meaning volunteer on an apple orchard at night who has no idea what she's doing. And I would like to try to avoid that for people because it's sort of like a miracle that anyone learns English that way. <laughs> As you were evolving, you know, you had this desire to teach English. Your whole career, like you said, it's dedicated to this discipline. When did you, I guess, start getting like breakthroughs where you're like, because you kind of, you mentioned it, right? You were in Chile, you were struggling or looking back on you said you can, I guess we're curious, are you, did you know you were struggling then or did you think you were doing a great job? And now looking back, you're like, oh, I, I struggled. Well, I just knew, I mean, first of all, half the time in Chile, my students spoke to me in Spanish. So that's never a good sign. I was teaching business people. I'd go to their offices and we'd <laughs> speak in Spanish. So like that's, I mean, come on. <laughs> How good a job could I have been doing? <laughs> but no, what I realized was that, that the books that I was being asked to use and the method I was using just made no sense. So I started, so I, so I got a degree in linguistics and I also, I actually didn't even really know what I was doing when I got that degree in linguistics. I didn't even know what linguistics was. And I discovered very quickly that theoretical linguistics has nothing to do with language teaching. It was, <laughs> it was very useful to learn what I didn't want to do. 
and I kept always trying to find an, a practical application of what I was learning. I'm, I like solving problems. I like putting research into practice. And so that's what I realized I wanted to do while I got my PhD and did a bunch of research on how to make language teaching work better. And I realized that, yes, I was doing a bad job before and we could find a way to do it better. But, but I ended up teaching. I've taught language my whole life. I taught ESL full-time at a community college outside of DC while I was in between getting my master's and my PhD. And I got better and better and better. And I watched other teachers teaching. And I realized that to do a good job, instruction needs to be personalized. And we can personalize it better if we use technology. There you go. And when did you start, I guess, getting breakthroughs where you were like, wow, this, I'm on to something. Because it's, so I'll, I'll say this, right? It's one thing to patent something. It's one thing to have a use. It's another to have a use, something that's useful. Uh, there's a lot of patents that are just sitting there on the shelf, not being used because, you know, they're not actually useful. When did you discover that your methodology was useful? Like, oh, this is, this is different. This is now like, this is a way that people can learn much faster, better. So I patented the technology, but I also included outcomes measures in the methodology. So the entire time I was first using the technology, I was measuring what learners' proficiency level was when they started. What was it at the end? How much did they use the platform? I built a whole framework for how to evaluate the efficacy of a language training program. And I used that framework to measure the success of the tool. So I saw that it worked right away. And I continue to innovate on the delivery and figuring out how to get people to be engaged in the platform, how to get them to use it more, how to drive outcomes quicker. I have access to a ton of data and I'm hoping over the next, I don't know, five years to be able to look at what people are doing. Does first language make a difference? Can I make it work better for someone who speaks Mandarin as a first language versus someone who speaks Greek as a first language or, you know, Spanish or Portuguese as a first language? Um, but I started sort of getting the breakthrough and realizing that I was onto something that worked when I could see learners improve their proficiency quickly with very little human intervention. Oh, no, that's pretty awesome. Now, curiously, did you have a technical, I guess, how did you accomplish the technical side of it? With a technical team. No, I can, you know, yes. You gotcha. Oh, <laughs> I didn't know if you, I didn't know if you could taught yourself how to code as well. <laughs> no, oh my, no, 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 no. I definitely did not teach myself how to code. I came up with the idea for how to do it and the way that it needed to work and went through and worked on the output of the various models to predict difficulty and extract keywords. But I worked with engineers who built it for me. Oh, that's pretty cool. So I'm the the lead author on the patents, but I had a computational linguist that I worked with and a technical lead that I worked with as well. You know, this is pretty fascinating. So talk about how, you know, so you have the methodology, you've invested in the technology to integrate this and make this deliverable. How did this transition from, you know, I would just like to talk about how, to, like a standalone business, right? So you, you're developing all these things. Was the vision always to have this as a standalone business? Were you thinking, hey, I'll just develop the technology license it to other companies that have better spread? Like, how did you say like, okay, now I want to transition. To, I'm going to run this thing, soup to nuts, everything. So it's a great question. And I was very lucky that I started working for a startup 10 years ago that didn't have this built yet. So they had raised money to build something and found me and I told them I knew what to build. <laughs> So we built it <laughs> and it worked. So I was super lucky. But again, I'd spent the previous, whatever, 14 years figuring out how to do it. Like it's really rare as a social scientist that you find a company that's literally building or wants to build the exact thing you've spent your whole career figuring out how to build. So I just built it and tested it and did it all with a company. And then the big transition for me was about two years ago the technology that I built was being used all over the world. And we did license it to some schools. We worked with universities. We did some of it in-house. We incorporated live instruction. There's a whole element of teachers teaching live classes synchronously through the platform. But I realized that the United States, which is where I started all of this back when I was on that apple orchard, when I was an undergraduate, <laughs> was doing a terrible job of teaching immigrants and refugees. And there should be a way to help them get access to this technology. So the new company that I founded, NGEN, that I launched in January, the whole mission of that company is to remove English as a barrier for immigrants and refugees in the United States using this very scalable technology that I was able to design and build at my previous employer. No, no, that's super fascinating. I think about, you know, obviously immigration, like it's a big topic, certainly a big topic, but without question, 
if people could upskill quicker, it makes it, you know, people have different varying reasons of why they believe or don't believe immigration should be easier, not easier, whatever. People have different political beliefs, personal beliefs, humanitarian beliefs, moral beliefs. It doesn't matter. But I think that's unilateral. If you could better, quicker learn English at a skill level, that the people would be more open to it. It's a pretty fascinating thing. And I think, you know, when I think for my own family, also my family's all immigrants, right? I, me and my cousins, a lot of us are first generation born Americans. Even myself, I actually didn't actually speak my first language, not English. My parents didn't teach me English. So I, I went to, I remember going to ESL as like a kindergartner or whatever. <laughs> but of course it was a lot easier back then to, for me to learn because I was only five. Yeah, I was a child. I could learn anything. <laughs> yes, it's much easier for children to learn. And it's actually wonderful that your parents spoke their first languages too, because do you still do you speak Mandarin with them now? So I can speak Mandarin, but my like I'm clearly have an accent, right? Like when I went to Taiwan this last summer when I was, uh, you know, I was on a surf vacation. This was pre-pandemic. Well, I guess the pandemic was going on, but it wasn't like there was like only a handful of cases in the United States when I was there. Everyone could tell the moment I started talking, oh, you're not from here. Right. You know what I mean? Because like all my inflections were off, but I could understand everything everyone was saying because my parents did not speak. They didn't speak English to me growing up. No, it's true. And so I actually got so excited about talking to you about, because it, the way language acquisition works is the minute you're born, you start learning languages. So the best way to have like a truly bilingual child is where you have one parent speak one language and the other parent speak the other language, but they both need to be native speakers of those two languages. <laughs> and so w what's interesting with you is that you only heard Mandarin until you went to elementary school and then everything became so focused on English and you were so young, you were able to just learn English as another, as another first language. Yes. I mean, I heard English, obviously, because I grew up, I grew up uh, born and raised in, in the United States. So I heard English plenty, but at home, you know, I didn't hear it. Like I was raised by my grandmother. I had my mom and dad. And then I think I was probably first exposed to English probably when I went to preschool. Right. And by the time I was in kindergarten, the kindergarten was, you know, told my parents, hey, we're going we're gonna to put your son in ESL because he's just a little bit behind compared to the other kids. And then of course that wasn't a problem. And then the we figured that <laughs> we figured that out. But then I think about people like uh, I think Kobe Bryant it was a great example. Kobe Bryant is the son of a professional basketball player that played in Europe. And so like Kobe Bryant grows up speaking like three or four languages. <laughs> right. I mean, it's true. It's it's what you hear. And it's it's more about getting people to use language to do something real. Yeah. So you mentioned upskilling, and that's my whole my whole mission is to help employers think about upskilling their frontline workers. So Employers offer health benefits. They offer all sorts of workplace benefits, but they don't usually think about offering English as a benefit. But you have many, many employers in this country who have thousands of workers who have very limited English skills. And if they could get some English at work through a mobile platform to improve their English skills in the workplace, they could be eligible for promotion and advancement with the same employer. Like, Employers would be able to develop talent pipelines and then promote their workers from within. It's about helping people because English is often the only thing that's holding them back. You often have highly trained foreign professionals who come here who get jobs as taxi drivers when they were a dentist in their home country because they don't have the English skills they need to try to get some sort of allied healthcare credential to get into a field that would be like the one where they were professionally trained and certified. So finding a way to reach people through their employers because I have something that's mobile and easily deployable and easily we can monitor how learners are doing really quickly. That's, that's the whole goal of the new company. No, I, I totally agree. I mean, we see it every day right now in the news where every different, you know, many, many, many companies are struggling hiring at all levels, wage requirements. You know, I, I saw, I think a recent article that uh, the amusements industry, for example, like Kings, like Kings Dominion, where we mm -hmm. were from Virginia, like they, they have to raise their wage to like 20 bucks an hour because no one wants, yes. they can't, they just cannot find workers. Now we have unemployment. But we also have a huge labor shortage. So what, what's the, what's the missing piece? Right. And there's a huge untapped talent pool. If you think about immigrants also by 2030, 97% of net workforce growth is going to be immigrants and their children. Yeah. Cause birth rates are falling. Yeah. I mean, there's, birth rates are falling. That's, uh, that's another thing that's happening in our country, or not just our country, a lot of countries. I mean, and the other thing is that we're all talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion, and we're talking about policies to make more inclusive and diverse workforces. But 
If we're not including English learners in those policies, we're leaving out a huge segment of the population that is already facing tons of systemic barriers to economic mobility. So this platform can quickly help people get the English skills they need to get better jobs, helping to address that problem as well. And I see the impact right now. I mean, I just did my Q1 impact survey where I send out a survey to thousands of learners who use the platform in the US and 88% said that they were in, and I had a response rate of 8%. So hundreds of learners responded saying that they were able to improve the way they communicated with their boss, with their colleagues. Like I think it was 38% got a pay raise or a promotion or a new job as a result of improved English skills. So 30% of respondents, that's pretty impressive. Yes, it is. That is really impressive. That is awesome. That's how I know it works because I can give you the English you need to work in grocery store retail. I mean, we have examples of, of people who've been kept working in the back of the house in a restaurant where they didn't communicate with customers, improving their English and getting promoted to manager level jobs, to jobs that take orders over the telephone that pay more because they're out interacting with the public just because they found a way to get the English they needed to get that promotion. So I got to ask then where or how, and I'm, this might be a complicated question, but so I'll try to, I don't want to oversimplify it. How will non-English speakers discover this product? Is that what you're relying on? So like, for example, if I'm like a, let's say, you know, first, if I'm an immigrant from, like I'll use my cousins who moved to the United States when they were like 20, you know, again, like, yeah, you, to your point, like they worked at, uh, they worked at retail, like doing stock handling things. Like they clearly were probably more educated to do other things, but you know, they had a huge language barrier. So they were stocking shelves to get started. How does someone like that find engine? Well, so I want them to find it through their employers. I don't want to put the burden on individuals to figure out how to do this on their own. I want employers to be offering this as a benefit. I want adult education programs offered. I work with Queens Public Library, New York Public Library through their sort of community programs. So the goal is to help extend the reach of existing organizations that work with immigrants and refugees, but then also to have employers and workforce boards and career development organizations make this available to job seekers to help them get the English skills they need to get into career training programs. Oh, no, that's awesome. Yeah, because I didn't know if you were going to play the uh, you know customer acquisition game on social media or something, because that gets really expensive. Uh <laughs> it gets expensive. And it's also really hard. Like Learning a language is hard, even if you're doing it through a mobile device. And so it works better if you're part of a more structured program. Like, hey, my boss is making this available to me and I can do this and in six months, I have so many stories of employers that have used it with their employees and seen real results, people getting the English they need to get promoted. It should be something that's part of the benefits package for workers or that's part of a, a job training program. Oh man, super fascinating, super noble. I love everything about this. Katie, I appreciate you sharing all the things that you're doing with Engine. But before you go, it is now time for the lightning round. The lightning round is brought to you by the Salesforce platform, the number one cloud platform for digital transformation of every experience. Katie, this is where we ask you questions outside of your world at Engine so that our audience can get to know you a little bit better. So you went to undergrad to UVA. What was your favorite undergrad experience? I went to UVA as well, so uh, you know I'm, I'm definitely biased. <laughs> <laughs> my, my favorite undergrad experience, there were so many, it's hard to say, I loved. I was part of the first year players theater organization at UVA. And so I got to direct a play my junior year, which was really, really cool. And I loved that. And I also loved working in the restaurants. I worked at a couple different restaurants in Charlottesville. And it's a very eye-opening experience to um, be a waitress in a college town. Oh man, that's got to hurt on the tip action. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it depends. And you'd be surprised. <laughs> yeah, I worked, at, I worked at a bar. It was, it was called... O'Neill's when I was there, it must've. Oh, on the corner. O'Neill's yeah, was exactly. on the corner. It was something else before. Did, was it the Greenskeeper before it was O'Neill's? The Greenskeeper was up the street. I remember O'Neill's. Yeah, I worked at Michael's Bistro, which was probably still there, okay. which was up above, it was up above Little John's. And I worked at Northern Exposure, this restaurant that was just off the corner. Okay, well, for, that's like a lot of frats have like their, I don't know, their date functions at Northern Exposure, so. Yes, they did. <laughs> My favorite was when I would, the, the frat would have a date function and I would include the tip in what they needed to pay me and then they would double tip. Yeah, because everyone's got to show that they're, you know, they got that swag. So, you exactly. know. <laughs> so as a graduate of or alum, alumna of UVA, well, how did you go to Maryland? That's a rival. I mean, what, what happened there? Well, it's funny because my dad 
has run a restaurant in College Park my entire life. So I actually grew up a Maryland fan and defected and went to UVA. And then I, then I came back and did my PhD at Maryland. I was working actually um, at the University of Maryland University College when I started my PhD. And it has one of the best programs in applied linguistics in the country. And so it, it made sense. But yes, I sometimes feel split. All right. Then we'll let it slide. We'll let it slide. <laughs> I'm very conflicted when I watch basketball. I almost always root for Virginia unless Virginia is not playing and then I'll root for Maryland. Okay. Okay. We'll, we'll let it slide. We'll let it slide. That sounds good. Now, where, where are you currently based? In New York. I live in Brooklyn. So Engine, is, are you build, you know, and I guess this is more work, but it's also a personal philosophy. Will Engine be a remote company or will it be a, a work from location? We're a fully, no, we're a fully distributed team. And then what is, this is a question about work, but I'd love for you to throw the pitch out there because I want to help you recruit. Tell me why, tell, tell the world why they should work at Engine. Because we're solving a real problem with technology in a scalable and sustainable way. So we are helping the 96% of limited English proficiency people in the United States who don't have access to instruction get the English they need to improve their economic mobility. And we're doing it using really cutting age and innovative technology. So it's, it's an exciting thing to be doing and an exciting way to solve a real problem. That is awesome. Now, this question is also about works, but I had to ask because oh, I'm curious. You know, obviously, actually, I don't know. The name of the company alludes to the fact that English will be the principal and always be the principal language you will help to teach. Well, do you think your technology would work for other languages? I do think my technology would work for other languages. It's something I've been asked over and over again. I'd love to be able to, uh, to build it for other languages. That's going to require significant capital. So first I have to solve this problem and then I can try to figure out how to do the next one. Very good. Well, Katie, it sounds like you've come a long way from your first classes that you taught <laughs> outside of Charlottesville, as well as your uh, foreign tours to Chile. It sounds like you've come a long way. It's pretty fascinating what you're doing. I think you're doing, you know, I hope the product takes off, you know, wildly successful because I think it'll, it'll benefit everyone that's involved. Thank you so much. And thank you for your time today. This was really fun. 